welcome to everyone who's joined us. Thank you so much. Um, we'll start at about 1.30. Uh, Representative Houlihan should be with us shortly. I see a couple of presenters um, have joined. If you're unable to unmute or turn your video on, please let me know. You can uh, in the chat. Hi there. Hi, welcome.
All right, welcome everyone. It looks like uh, Representative Houlihan just joined us and it is 1.30. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. If the panelists want to um, turn their videos on, you can keep muted for now, uh, but I'll turn it over to Christina. Sorry, I have to figure out where the, the mute button is. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, thank you for joining us for the second workshop of Chester County Businesses. Uh, as you may have recalled, the very first one was on Congressional Startup Day in August of 2020. And there we focused on entrepreneurship, uh, on resources that individuals might need to start a business, uh, on kind of all of the different things that we might need to be able to be successful entrepreneurs. Today, we'll be discussing resources for existing businesses and how they can grow and thrive. So some attention will also be placed today on Coatesville revitalization as a qualified opportunity zone or a QOZ and its downtown development. We'll also spend some time today addressing the disparities between experiences of white businesses and owners that are, who are black. According to the Small Business Administration reporting, black owned businesses retain on average more employees than businesses owned by any other race. Despite this, less than 30% of small businesses are minority owned. Our economy is at its strongest when our businesses thrive and our small businesses thrive most when their makeup reflects the makeup of this country. Everyone, no matter their race, should be able to access and success this American economy. This past year, small businesses have been hit incredibly hard by this pandemic. And that's why today's meeting is so crucial, so much more crucial than ever, because we need to be doing everything in our power to help people like you. Small business owners and workers, whether uh, what it is, hopefully the last leg of this global of this global crisis. And I actually am one of those people who is not quite as optimistic as everybody else's in terms of this last leg of the crisis. I believe we still have quite a long way to go. In Congress, I helped pass recently the American Rescue Plan, which is a comprehensive stimulus package that works to address our struggling small businesses. And some of our priorities based on what you all gave me uh, from our community, made it into that final bill that I believe will be very helpful to this in our community. That bill allocated 14, I'm sorry, $15 billion in flex, flexible grants to help the smallest, most severely impacted businesses persevere through this pandemic. That bill also provided $28 billion for new grant programs to support our hard hit small restaurants and other food and drinking establishments. That bill also provided the Paycheck Protection Program with an additional $7.25 billion in funding to support small businesses and nonprofits that had been previously excluded. And lastly, it devoted an additional $1.25 billion in funding to support live venue operations, theater, theatrical productions, live performing arts associations and operators, museum operators, motion picture theater operators and talent representatives that are struggling to make, make, end week, make ends meet. These are the people who lost their businesses or had to shut their businesses down very first and will probably be amongst the last to be able to return uh, to live events. Additionally, I've introduced my bipartisan Ramp for Innovators Act. This piece of legislation would provide commercialization services for federally funded small businesses uh, who are investing in research and development ideas under the SBIR, or Small Business Innovation Research Group, or the SBTT, which is the STTR program. We have a very, very long road ahead, but I am very much committed to working with you all, our small business leaders in our community to rebuild this economy. I'm really, really grateful today to be joined by an expert panel. We have with us today, Regina Hairston, who's the president and CEO of the African American Chamber of Commerce for Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Natalie Fatalek, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, our first, the first vice president of the MidPen Bank, Patrick Hayakawa, vice president for innovation and emerging technologies at Chester County Economic Development Council, and Anna Ship, the executive director of the Sustainable Business Network or SBN. Each of our panelists will introduce themselves and provide very brief opening remarks. And we'll start with Regina, if that's okay. Thank you, Congresswoman, and thank you for having me today for this very important conversation on entrepreneurship. The African American Chamber of Commerce, PA, New Jersey, and Delaware is, 27, is a 27 year old membership organization that serves businesses in the public, private, 
independent sector who are committed to supporting the economic empowerment and growth of African American businesses located in southeastern Pennsylvania, southern New Jersey, and northern Delaware. AACC provides unique opportunities to connect Black business owners to information and programming to help start, grow, and sustain their businesses. We do that through advocacy for legislation and processes for the ease of doing business in Pennsylvania and the surrounding states. Currently, we are advocating that federal COVID relief dollars are going directly to support the Black-owned businesses. We are looking to bring dollars for the Community Navigator pilot program to the chamber so that our reach is greater, um, to provide technical assistance that is so much needed to Black businesses. The American Rescue Plan Act dollars that come to the state are earmarked for projects that directly invest into minority Black enterprises, and that we are making sure that our businesses that were shuttered twice the rate of non-Black owned businesses um, are receiving these dollars. We do empowerment through education by providing workshops and trainings to build capacity and connectivity to resources and opportunities from our various partnerships with government, nonprofit, corporations, and philanthropy. We recognize that minority-owned businesses have, have and need support pre-COVID and have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Between February and April of this of 2020, 440,000 Black-owned businesses in the U.S. closed. They made up 41% of the total of 1.1 million, according to the National Bureau of Economic Research. When businesses close, jobs are lost. African-American-owned businesses create pathways to success for historically underserved and underrepresented communities. African-American-owned businesses play a critical role in building generational wealth. By empowering these businesses and organizations like the Chamber, there's an opportunity for generations to come to benefit for businesses of today being built and thriving. Our mission has always been and continues to engage in program for African-American-owned businesses in the region who are facing, facing challenges structural or capital hurdles and our members when when that when they are part of our chapter they will receive the institutional support needed to run a successful business along with the engagement and networking opportunities necessary to continue growing thank you very much regina for those opening remarks and next i'd like to welcome natalie uh, for her opening remarks thank you um I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. My name is Natalie Falatek, um, and I am the first vice president or director of small business lending here at MidPen Bank. And I've been with the bank for about 10 years. Um, and prior to coming into our SBA and government guaranteed lending role, I was a commercial lender. And as a commercial lender, I was kind of known as the lender who focused on the little guys. Um, it, it used to be a joke that I would do more loans every year than every other lender because my loans were so much smaller and the businesses that I were touching was touching were so much smaller. So that naturally led me into when we were looking um, to revamp our SBA program and our small business program, um, I fell into that role and, and took that over. And it's really um, just kind of made my heart sing um, and made my heart happy to be working um, with the smallest businesses through the SBA program and through all of our lending programs here. Um, one of the things, initiatives that we started prior to COVID was a small relationship focused program to help expedite um, and simplify our commercial lending process for small businesses and our smaller relationships. And you know, part of the reason that we did that was um, you know, to expedite it for everybody, but to also increase access um, to minority owned businesses and small businesses who may not have a dedicated commercial lender who comes out to visit them every six months or a couple times a year. But to make that process simple so that everyone had access to those uh, SBA and conventional lending resources here at MidPen Bank. Uh, since um, COVID, um, I think that this week marks one year that my life has really been um, taken over by the Paycheck Protection Program. And uh, you know, those lending programs. Um, and we have done approximately, I believe that we're up to about 8,000 loans 
Um, you know, we're approaching 100,000 jobs protected all across the country. And our loan size is smaller um, than the national average. And that's because we have been focused on making this process simple, um, easy, accessible for all businesses. Um, one of the things that came to light early in the Paycheck Protection Program and became a hot topic um, in Washington and within our own community was access for minority owned businesses being denied access to this program. Um, so that was definitely a, a focus for us. We set no minimum loan amount. We you know, didn't require you to have an existing um, business checking account or commercial relationship with MidPen Bank. And that was because we wanted to drive access to the program for everyone. Uh, we also took a look at um, some of the hurdles and reasons why some of our minority owned businesses were not able to access the program. Maybe it was because they hadn't filed a tax return for 2019, or you know, they were a little bit delayed in some of that reporting filing and didn't have access to the reports. And we partnered both with our own commercial lending team to be able to help small businesses prepare the reporting that they need, but also with some local accountants um, and specifically minority owned accountants and um, accountants that focused on that target audience and worked with them to help make um, resources available to them if they needed to quickly file a tax return or file a 941 report that they may have been delayed in filing to help them file that you know, in a way that was expeditious but also cost effective for them and didn't lock them out of these programs. So um, I'm thankful to be here and I'm excited to talk about this. Uh, really, really helpful, Natalie, and, and great opening remarks. Uh, I'd like now to turn it over to Patrick, please, for his remarks. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Congresswoman. My name is Patrick Hayakawa. I'm the Vice President at the Chester County Economic Development Council, and I'm uh, really happy to be here and meeting all of you on uh, a really important topic. I, I have to say I agree with the Congresswoman. It's, it's been a long year, uh, as Natalie said also, but we're not out of the woods yet, not out of the woods from a public health standpoint and certainly not out of the woods from an economic development standpoint as I think all these folks on the call whether with the Chamber of Commerce or an economic development or perhaps business owners yourself um, can attest to. Uh, by way of background for myself and my organization the Chester County Economic Development Council is an independent nonprofit entity. We've been around for 60 years and our philosophy uh, in Chester County, we're fortunate we have a diverse economy. We've got healthcare, we've got agriculture, we've got technology, right? So we really focus on uh, nurturing what we got, you might say. So some EDC, some economic development corps are all about business attraction. You know, how can we win the next Amazon? How can we get that big company in here? We're fortunate, sure, we're welcome out of state and out of region employers, but we put most of our energies into uh, farming, not hunting, as my boss, Gary Smith, likes to say sometimes, right? So for those small businesses in our own region, can we inject the capital, uh, the site selection assistance, the workforce development assistance, uh, all those things that every business, large or small, needs to succeed. So those are our three main services is uh, access to capital. We have an in-house SBA lender. So any small businesses on the line who are not familiar with the SBA, I highly recommend you get familiar with those programs or, or look into them. They um, can be great incentive for, for small businesses at borrowing at low rates and fixed rates. Um, we do a lot of site selection assistance. So if you're opening a new shop or maybe your manufacturer is growing and you need help finding the location or what's a building available or what's, I don't understand the zoning, all those things, we're not a broker. We try to uh, impart impartial, unbiased knowledge and, and fact finding so that businesses can expand and find the site that they need to grow locally. Um, and lastly, we do a lot of work on workforce development, which is uh, for both uh, current adults looking for a career change or trying to upskill so they can be competitive in their job search, or for young people in our region, how do we show them that uh, there are promising career paths, uh, regardless of the zip code they grow up in, regardless of the background, that they can pursue uh, the career and the education that they want. So that's us in normal times in the COVID year. We've been doing a lot of the front lines. Well, I shouldn't say front, my wife is a healthcare worker, so I can't say front lines. They're, they're the front lines, right? But maybe we're, we're the second line sometimes it feels like in terms of emergency business support. So we've done uh, about half a dozen now different emergency grant 
relief programs and loan programs for small business relief. There's current one ongoing in Chester County called CHIRP. So if you're in the health, uh, excuse me, hospitality or restaurant industry, that's an open window right now that we could talk about. Um, so it's been all hands on deck trying to get uh, dollars and resources into businesses in need. Um, there's more to be done there. And I'm also excited to thank you, Congressman, for that, that new stimulus bill. That's gonna bring, um, it just in Chester County alone, I believe it's about $100 million now that can be invested in public health and business um, uh, protection. So uh, I think there's a lot of conversation going around and maybe some questions or discussion on this call could happen of, um, okay, how do we prepare? There's, uh, there was a time for kind of triage and getting emergency dollars into people's hands, but what about the next two years, three years? Maybe now is the time to build infrastructure, if you will, build programs, think for the long term. So that's certainly on our minds um, at the EDC. Uh, and when it comes to inclusion and race, um, even, even before COVID, folks on this call, as has been referenced, um, uh, Black-owned businesses were, were twice as likely uh, to be rejected by their financiers and seeking capital. Uh, during COVID, Black-owned businesses in the Philadelphia region have closed at 1.5 times the rate of white-owned businesses. So it's, um, there's been inequities and problems in the system before COVID, and it's clear that COVID has, has exacerbated those and, and made it even more urgent um, to address them. So it's a timely uh, discussion and something we're, we're actively working on and want to talk with more people about. So, so glad to be here. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Patrick. I know that COVID really has laid bare so many of the inequities that already existed. And I think, I hope it has made it more evident to folks who ha maybe hadn't had their eyes open before uh, where all of the pain points are in our society. Uh, and with that, the last uh, opening remarks will be with Anna. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Council um, Congressman. Congresswoman, my goodness. <laughs> it's been a full, full day so far uh, for having me here. Uh, my name is Anna Ship. I am the Executive Director of the Sustainable Business Network of Greater Philadelphia. Um, and I'm really eager, of course, to join all of you um, and have, again, kind of a conversation about uh, what, what we prefer to say local independent businesses, not necessarily using the word small business. Um, and, you know, and yet we know the reason for that is, you know, 99.6% of all businesses in the state of Pennsylvania are small businesses. And um, more nearly half of all workers in the state are employed by small business. And small businesses were responsible for 67% of all new jobs coming out of the last recession. So they are the backbone of our economy. Um, we've known that for, for a long time. Um, but that is why I'm excited to have this conversation really focus on small businesses and relief and recovery. Um, so a little bit about the Sustainable Business Network. Um, we are building a just, green, and thriving economy in the region. Um, we've worked to empower the region's diverse independent business community to be a force for good, um, enhancing and advancing industries that are critical to small businesses, a vibrant local equitable and climate resilient economy, um, and advocating for an economic ecosystem that centers localism, serves community needs, shares wealth, and protects our environment. Our members are diverse local independent businesses that practice and measure success by the triple bottom line of people, planet, and profit. And our programming educates business owners about financially, socially, and environmentally responsible business practices, facilitates honest and supportive conversations and discussions among peers, and provides really important opportunities for civic dialogue. And our advocacy focuses on solutions that advance a just, green, thriving economy. Um, since our founding about 20 years ago, we have remained the region's only membership and advocacy organization. Um, focusing exclusively on independent and values-driven businesses. Um, we, of course, again, are focused on relief and recovery um, for our independent business community. Um, and part of that recovery, and I'm glad you mentioned this, Patrick, is, is really trying to, like, let's start looking forward. Um, and SBN has a significant interest in not just the economic ecosystem that was creating the inequities in the first place, but also changing, you know, changing things in our in the industries and sort of the um, uh, the other parts of the ecosystem that we pay attention to, and really centering industries that are good for local businesses, family supporting jobs, improving those industries from the inside out. Um, so we have a focus on nature-based stormwater management, energy efficiency, renewable energy 
and really responsible local food systems. Um, so that's, that's us and we're eager to have those conversations. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Anna. Um, really familiar with the work of SBN and grateful that you are here as well. Uh, and I also want to take a, a couple seconds to say hey to my team who's here, um, Curtis and Mashari, and it looks like Scott is also here in the lur lurking in the lower left corner, at least on my screen. Uh, if you guys could just uh, say hey and, and just briefly say what, uh, what we all do together and what you individually do as, as part of our team, I would appreciate that too. Let's sure. start with, with Curtis. Thanks, Chrissy. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Curtis. I work out of our Westchester office. I handle um, relevant to this conversation, small business outreach. Uh, so I work with our scheduler to schedule this. Um, I put my email in the chat. So if you would like to talk about anything in more detail that comes up today or something that doesn't come up today, I'd love to take some time to chat with you. Um, I can also help sometimes with certain small business administration applications if anything's held up. Um, we can often help with casework on that front. So please do reach out if you would like to discuss any further. Thanks, Curtis. And let's go, head over to my right to Mashri. Thanks, Chrissy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Mashri, uh, I handle our civil rights portfolio, which is uh, particularly relevant to this conversation. I've also put my email address in the chat. Um, I work in the Reading office, but I've really got my ear to the ground all over Chester County, as well as our portion of Berks to try to find any legislative opportunities to pass forward from a, a civil rights perspective. So we've got some intersection here, and uh, that's why you see multiple of us on the call. Thanks, Mashri. And lastly, he stopped lurking, Scott, Scott Nelson as well. Hi, Scott. Good afternoon, Chrissy and everyone. Um, I handle, uh, adjacent to this conversation, financial services and also economic development. So I am very interested to learn more about that. I also long, long ago handled small business. So I still, still do care about it, but I know it's in great hands with Curtis. And thanks for my team for that. And if it's okay right now, what we're, we'll do with the next uh, couple of minutes is I'd love to kind of ask some opening questions um, of each one of you. And I know if anybody has any uh, more specific, more personal questions, or, or uh, please do put them in the chat. Uh, we'll be happy to take them too. And if it's okay, I'll start with you, Regina. Uh, and you, I would love to hear a little bit about what the specific barriers are uh, for Black and other minority entrepreneurs, and um, you know what can we be doing to to help? I guess is the next question. Sure. So I'm going to start with the uh, most prominent one, which I think we've all mentioned is access to capital, access to affordable capital, access to equitable capital and access to capital. So that is the that is the largest one. And that just creates so many other um, barriers. So we think about um, market barriers. So what we know is that most Black entrepreneurs, they go into the same five sectors because there's a low entry for capital. And I wrote them down. Um, they are healthcare and social assistance, professional scientific and technical services, administrative support and waste management, retail trade and accommodations and food services. And what we also know is that of those five sectors, they only profit 20% of the national uh, revenue. So you have low entry. And so most people flock to these particular sectors and these are the hardest hit sectors by the pandemic um, for our workers and for our businesses. So those are um, some of the largest barriers that we see. It's barriers to expertise so there's five stages of entrepreneurship. And the first stage is the um, ideation stage. And this is the stage where you're looking at a, a problem and you're thinking about a solution for this problem. And this is typically, um, if you have access to services, you're talking to your attorneys, you're talking to your CPA to determine how to structure your business. Am I going to be an LLC? Am I going to be an S Corp? Well, you're not thinking, well, if I'm going to be an LLC and then if I'm paying myself, then I'm paying twice taxes twice. So you're just 
setting yourself up um, in a position on the beginning stages where you're not going to be re really able to grow later down the road. Um, and you don't have that back office, you don't have the HR, you don't have the CPA, the attorney, the attorney, and so forth, nor do you have the social capital. So there's a social cultural barrier, right? And so a lot of folks, they're surrounded by people that they can call up and say, hey, I'm thinking about, should I do this with my um, supplier or chain? Or should I think about um, investing this way? Should I take out a loan? Um, but our Black entrepreneurs don't necessarily have that social capital to support those decisions that are being made. And then there's just institutional, institutional barriers um, for the Black owned businesses. And that's just location. So I think when um, you all reached out to me, you asked me about Coatesville. And so Coatesville is what, about 45% African-American and 26% or 25% Hispanic. Well, those are the businesses that have been hardest hit. Those are the, the unemployment numbers that are the highest for African-Americans and for Hispanic populations. So when you think about who these businesses are doing business with, you're 37 miles from Philadelphia. Then you have Westchester on the other end. There is transportation that's required. With the restrictions, you're not necessarily doing business with the local folks unless you were able to pivot virtually. And so that is, that's just a barrier to doing business in your location. We know that Black businesses and African Americans usually congregate in six of the same cities, which are the cities that have the least amount of prosperity for African Americans. So even though if you are a middle class African American, you tend to live in areas with poverty for African-Americans. So if your business is not able to do business with non-African-Americans, then you're not going to be able to grow. So it starts with capital, access to capital, access to how you're structuring your business and access to information. So at the chamber, what we're doing, we've created a program and we work with all the partners on the phone in some capacity or another on coaching to capital, creating those banking relationships that we found doing PPP that did not exist, making sure that black businesses have a pathway to success where it relates to capital, working with our community banks. It was so important that doing PPP, that those applications were relaxed for the African-American businesses. So some of the things that were required for that first draw of PPP, it was changed. And it was because that money was not reaching our small businesses. So working to uh, make those structural changes and making sure that we're working with our Black businesses to make sure they have the back end support that they need to need to be successful. Really fascinating. And I really appreciated um, some of the differentiation in terms of the barriers to entry and the uh, and the sectors that black entrepreneurs are finding themselves seeking out for obvious reasons because of the low barriers to entry. And that's actually given me some ideas that I'll that I'll work with my team on to see if there's some way to provide more um, robust pathways to those other places. You know, having been an entrepreneur myself, I know the barriers to entry are some of the biggest challenges. And, and also, to your point, kind of having a business plan and being able to operationalize those big, beautiful ideas and being able to have a network of people who, who can help you operationalize those and, and make sure that you're not making uh, silly mistakes like, you know, what sort of corporate form are you going to, you know, take on when you begin are also things that um, we all need help on. And I really appreciate your, your uh, clarification on that. And a lot of what you said about what PPP started as and needed to evolve to, because it was always intended for those smallest of small businesses uh, and for women-owned, veteran-owned, minority-owned businesses, uh, that this, because we are 90-something percent of the businesses in the, in the country and 90, as you mentioned, I think it was Anna, 97 or 98 percent in, in the Commonwealth. So we've got a lot of work to do. And Regina, you kind of led into my next question, which is for Patrick, and it's specific to Coatesville. You know, our community has Coatesville. Uh, we have Westchester. Uh, we have the Kennett area. We have uh, Reading is all part of our community's uh, sixth congressional district. But for Patrick, what kind of challenges does Coatesville 
specifically face compared to the rest of the Chester County area? And what kind of opportunities are there uh, yeah. specific to Coatesville? Yeah, so I mean, my brain, I'm, I'm, I'm biased because I've been working on some projects and, and following some positive news in Coatesville. My brain jumps to the, to the opportunities. I mean, um, Coatesville, as some people know, it's the only it's only real city, right, that we have in the district. I mean, we have Reading, right, or in Chester County, certainly, right? So, and all of the, the potential that that brings as far as um, agglomeration and density of people and density of ideas. And that's, that's what you want in entrepreneurship. You want people um, bumping elbows and, and trading ideas. Um, you know, it, it has uh, led to the specific project I, I have in mind that I was hoping to get to talk about, which is um, the Nth Innovation Center. And that's a consequence of the uh, Opportunity Zone, right, that was designated in Coatesville a few years back, and also the Keystone Innovation Zone. So um, we have looked at how can we braid programs. It's always a combination of, of entities, of partners, of, of groundwork. So uh, the Nth Innovation Center is, the idea is to be a, a, an entrepreneurship incubator for predominantly technology-based companies and entrepreneurs and, and startups. And Regina was talking about industries um, with barriers, certain barriers to entry. Technology uh, and, and science-based innovation is certainly associated with a high barrier to entry. So one of the opportunities I'm excited about is um, exposing young people in Coatesville, exposing students to some of the startups and other technology that could be housed in that building, whether it's through some of the internship programs that are being talked about, uh, to showing that these are careers that are possible. These are paths to paying jobs, paid internships that you can have yourself. And also not just the students, but the folks uh, living in Coatesville too. So, um, you know, we had an example, this touches on Regina's point about social capital. Um, uh, a client of mine, she's a nurse in Coatesville. She's an RN, she great, you know, healthcare industry knowledge, but she had an idea for a health, healthcare software app. On, on a mobile device, right? But she didn't know, uh, you know, the first thing about software development or intellectual property or um, how to test out if this was a good idea. And capital was certainly going to be one of her challenges, but even, you know, three or four degrees before capital, there were social capital type questions. If, if you have not had, um, or I should say, if you have had through generations inequality, there's layers there, they, they build up, right? So if, if we had an opportunity to go to college or my uncle was an attorney or my aunt was a business owner, I have a Rolodex, I have a community of people that I can call and bounce ideas off of. So in, in my day-to-day -day life, I'm, I'm not a lender, I'm not a banker, but I'm an entrepreneur coach more. And I find that, that lack of, of a social Rolodex or a social friendly faces, whether it's a Natalie at Mid Penn or or, or, or really any of the resources in the region that, hey, can I call and ask a silly question or, or find out what I don't know? Um, so coming back to the Nth Innovation Center, I'm excited about more kind of cross-pollination just among people who are doing tech work, young people who are curious about tech work, um, current people who are looking for a job that haven't thought of tech careers. So it's a small example, but it's a really exciting one because uh, that Nth Innovation Center is the first commercial uh, real estate construction project, if I'm not mistaken, in Coatesville, in the city of Coatesville um, in 50 years. So it's, it's a big milestone. Yeah, and that's really, really exciting. And I love the opportunities that I have to get into Coatesville because you can feel the energy and you can feel the sense of community uh, and the real opportunity that is it, that is Coatesville. And I'm hoping that in the new and upcoming infrastructure uh, bill that we're all working on, that there will be opportunities to bring in places like Coatesville and Reading uh, and, and Kennett and all those places that have been kind of disenfranchised for so, so long in so many different ways. And I'm, I'm looking forward very much for hope and help on the way for that. And to your point, Patrick, about um, kind of the incubators or help, uh, the ramp back that I was talking about that we've introduced again, this Congress that I, that I authored has a little bit of that in it too. It, it's access to capital, which Regina talked about, but the capital comes faster and it also comes with the opportunity um, to, to think about how to operationalize it, how to take those ideas and actually make them viable ideas. And it also talks to those entrepreneurs uh, in the research and development primarily space about how to protect their intellectual property, which is another thing that um, entrepreneurs uh, struggle with 
when they have that awesome idea, they don't always know how to cover down on it and how to protect it and how to make sure that it doesn't become somebody else's awesome idea. Uh, and so that's kind of what the, the Ramp Act is about as well. And so thank, thank you, Patrick, for that. Yeah. Uh, my next question is for Natalie, and it has to do with your, your conversation about what your, what your organization has done and, and tried to do differently is, is to try to be you know, a humane um, access to capital. And I think that that's, and sadly, it shouldn't be innovative and shouldn't, shouldn't be something that's unusual, but it is in a lot of ways. And so without kind of giving any trade secrets away, you've already talked a little bit about how you've tried, your organization has tried to set yourself apart from other lenders in terms of providing, you know, relatively small loans to lots and lots of people who aren't necessarily banked to begin with. What resources do you think that you hope to expand how do you see your uh, your organization coming out of the pandemic and what advantages do you now have as a result of having been um, so um, generous with you know your operations? Yeah, I think it's definitely a unique challenge, right? Because we're certainly in an economic time. Um, you know, part of my role as a credit officer and approving credit decisions, you know, we're at a time where everybody's hesitant to do that in COVID and how is this business, especially with startups, um, you know, and newer businesses, how are they going to be able to weather this storm? Um, so talking to them, uh, I think that that is one of the first things is helping businesses um, that we're working with on, you know, PPP loans, helping them to think through how do they come out of this? How do they pivot if what they need to do is pivot? Or how do they find um, you know, the PPP loans are great, but they only take you so far. Um, we're finding that a lot of businesses need an extra hand. So, you know, one of the things that we're really excited about are the, um, you know, the fee waivers within the small business administration programs, the additional um, guarantee percentage that's on those loans. Um, we believe that that is, um, you know, that will allow us to continue to support more of these small businesses. Um, as they come out of the pandemic and as they move through the pandemic. Um, you know, one of the other things that we've really seen that has been really important as um, we kind of, you know, as everybody kind of retreated and closed their lobbies, um, you know, which closing lobbies in physical branch locations isn't something that's new for banks. I think that we've been finding that banks have been doing that. And sometimes, you know, one of the areas that are hardest hit are the minority centered areas. Um, I look at you know, a local to Harrisburg, um, you know, there's a community here, Steelton, um, where we became the only bank left, you know, because everybody else, and we made a commitment um, that we were not leaving that market. <laughs> like, no matter what happened, we were going to be there for those, you know, not only business owners, but for the community members that needed a place to walk and do their banking. Um, but, I think that that has really, you know, being out there, um, thinking about who at the bank do they feel comfortable calling? They might not have a relationship with a commercial lender, but making sure that the tellers and the branch managers are out in their communities um, and that they know how to recognize, you know, keywords. Um, we talked a lot about how to recognize when somebody's asking for help that may not be directly saying, um, you know, who do you know that does X, Y, Z, but, you know, they're talking about ideas that they're having and how to recognize that and help them make those connections. You know, we talk about, I know a guy, um, which is kind of our way of saying, you know, that's how we kind of, there's lender liability issues if, you know, I start doing their financial reports for them. But, um, you know, we talk about, I, I know a guy that can help you with this, or I know a guy that can help you with that. Um, and encouraging them, you know, to do things like, eat lunch um, at, you know, the local establishment where everybody eat lunch, eats lunch, not because it's great to support those businesses um, through your dollars that you're paying for your lunch, but also because of the conversations that you can have just connecting with people when you're out in your communities. Um, so we are excited um, as, you know, vaccines happen and things start to open up the ability to get out there and do that again and continue those relationships that we've made. Um, you know, we are continuing um, to help businesses as we identify a need um, for a business to help them build on those resources um, through that. I spend a, you know, a large amount of time um, teaching our tellers um, 
you know, how to work with a business and, you know, take their bank account statement and turn it into a really simple profit and loss report for them. Like let's, you know, and it, it's hand um, and long conversations, um, but we have time for that right now, right? That's one of the benefits of COVID is that we have time um, to spend with our customers, but to sit down and help them look through their bank statements and, you know, maybe that's all they were doing was just putting it in the account and paying bills out and they weren't looking at a profit and loss, but to help them um, use some of our tools and resources that we have, even if it's just, you know, spreadsheets that do that for them as we move you forward. Know, it's really interesting hearing you because I'm now sitting, you know, in the position uh, in Congress, which in a lot of ways is a small business in itself. My office is 18 members strong. You've, you've got four of us on the phone right now. Um, and we are in a lot of ways, a really small um, entrepreneurial venture too. And we, you know, have different areas of expertise and different ways of of learning from other offices, what best practices are and networking and, and having a pretty diverse entrepreneurial background myself, I'm struck by how similar all industries really are, you know, from banking to, to politics, to, you know, manufacturing and all the, in education, um, it's relationship driven. And as soon as you're able to sort of recognize, even as an introvert myself, you know, that people matter and that teams matter, um, I think that the better off you are as an entrepreneur and it actually leads me to Anna, which I think is kind of a good, a good question as well. Yours is an organization, the SBN, um, that is, you know, a, a chamber of commerce of sorts, in, maybe even literally, you know, what is the benefit of joining an organization such as SBN to somebody like a small business or, or entrepreneur? I appreciate that. Um, and pardon the my, my cat here. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I have a dog too. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there, there's a couple core things. Um, it's, it's obviously, I think the I mean, second, second to capital, um, a supportive peer community is, you know, one of the top listed resources um, for small businesses. And so um, I think that, you know, in addition to the content that we provide that helps um, independent business owners be better businesses, um, and, and bring their bring their values to their workplace, to bring their values to their business. Um, we have that really, really unique supportive peer community where um, there is this incredible honesty and vulnerability. Um, it's really hard to be a business owner on the best of days, right? And it's definitely hard in the middle of a crisis. Um, but it's hard to be vulnerable when you are, um, you know, maybe thinking about how your competitors would, you know, would take advantage of that, right? And so it's a pretty lonely place to be. And so one of the really unique things about our organization is this honesty and this vulnerability that our members um, really practice with each other in sharing their challenges, their experiences, their learnings, um, you know, how they've overcome certain things and they wanna pass that forward in this really amazing um, cooperative and collaborative way. And obviously, I mean, the advocacy piece, I think, is a really big, big piece, too. I mean, having conversations with, with you and your team um, and other, you know, electeds to really um, amplify this voice of the independent business owner, um, you know, we know, we all know the power that business has in, you know, in our um, democracy. And so, but, it, but it's, it's not balanced, right? There isn't parity. In, in which business voices are heard. Um, and so given the size and scale of the independent business community, you know, in local, you know, places like greater Philadelphia, the state of Pennsylvania, but across the country, um, it's really important that that independent business voice is heard, given all the other things that we know about what small businesses do for our economy, right? We know that all the research says that, you know, when we have a robust, vibrant, diverse, independent business community, we have reduced poverty, we have better community cohesion, we have better sustainability, we have, you know, better tax revenues, right? And so, um, so we want to make sure that that voice is, is raised up, um, and this really authentic voice is raised up, um, and that we're, you know, and that we're representing then the voice you know, of these businesses, um, you know, to, to you and your team and again, other, other folks that represent them. Um, if I may, I, you know, one of the things that, um, that kind of in that bucket of advocacy is to kind of go back to some of the other parts of the conversation 
um, around what independent businesses need and, and really kind of getting in that equity space. Um, really grateful, Regina, for your, for your remarks and Patrick for yours too. Um, we know that the vast majority of BIPOC businesses and women-owned businesses and LGBTQ owned businesses are independent. They're, they're smaller independent businesses. They have, they have fewer employees and they have less revenue than your, than your white male owned business. Um, and so it's not, so it's not just the startup piece, but it's also that growth and thriving piece that's really, really important. And that gets into the ecosystem that is absolutely in addition to capital um, and that social capital, but it also gets to zoning and tax codes and other things that, you know, are really, really critical, um, you know, wage, right? Other really critical things that are um, important for that, that growth and that advancement um, and to support businesses in the ways that they want to grow, not in the way that, you know, we society say that they should grow, right? Like you must, you must, you know, become a national brand. No, like if a business doesn't want to do that, like help them grow in the way they want to grow. Um, and, and thinking about all of those layers of complexity um, that, that you touched on um, that, gets, that gets to that social capital, but you know, those, that legacy of, of lack of wealth building, and which mm -hmm. you know, informs, um, informs so many things, including the resources that various neighborhood education you know, facilities have and that, you know, how that kind of perpetuates things as well. So, so I think what we're trying to do is just really think about that entire ecosystem and all of those different pieces that are so um, hard to decouple from the entirety um, of the challenge that is that is helping the independent business community. Yeah, I think that, you know, something like the SBN or something like a chamber or just any sort of aggregating group that we've talked about uh, has so much power to its membership. You know, you talked a little bit about um, advocacy slash lobbying, even though it seems to be a dirty word, it really isn't. You know, it's it's you raising your voice to say this is, you know, who you are and what you need of to the people who can hopefully make a difference in what it is that you need. So I think people, you know, should really consider the power of aggregating themselves and their voices. Uh, and I also think, you know, to some degree, and this is relevant to this conversation at the micro level, but also at the macro, which is you can't be what you can't see. And if you don't find, seek out other people uh, to learn from and to benefit from and for them to learn from you, um, you're also doing yourself a disservice um, as well. And even if it's not a, a business that's very similar to yours and identical to your point about your competition and you don't want to necessarily open up and expose yourself, there are just so many similarities between really any kind of business. Uh, and I think your last point about what do you want to be when you grow up is something that I've always struggled with it with the different entrepreneurial ventures that I've been part of, which is it doesn't mean that you are not successful if you choose not to be a multi-billion dollar you know, multinational organization. You can choose to be whatever you want to be when your business grows up. And it could be just a small mom and pop shop or something that you do with your friends. Uh, is you need to have those conversations with yourselves and with other people who have that kind of experience to, to plan for succession if that's appropriate or not. Um, and so I think that those are really good conversations. Uh, I rem remind people, and so far I don't see any questions in the chat, so I have a couple more um, conversations which have to do, I think Anna, you sort of led us in this direction and I'll leave it to you guys to, to let me know when you'd like to pi uh, pipe in. But the question of how can the SBA, as an example, um, be more helpful to black and minority owned businesses, uh, not just during the pandemic, but hopefully as we come out of the pandemic, I would love to have ideas from you guys. And, and maybe since I haven't heard from Regina for a while, I'll start uh, with her. And then of course, this should be a much more organic conversation and not you know, kind of me calling on folks. So why don't you start, Regina? Certainly. So I, I laughed to myself when you said that I was on another roundtable discussion and the SBA was on. And so the regional director said, uh, yeah, I created PPP. And I said, wow, you created PPP? <laughs> it's astounding. <laughs> that was a bold uh, <laughs> pronunciation. Or, uh, so I said, okay, you created PPP. Well, here's where the problem comes in. And this, I do have a background in um, lobbying and I do have a background in 
and government. And oftentimes what will happen is Congress people will come up with these great um, initiatives or piece of legislation, or there's this relief act that's passed. And then it does sort of filter down to the regional directors of agencies to sort of determine what those regulations are going to be and how they're going to implement them. And so when that happens, it's helpful if there's someone having a conversation, what does this mean for really small businesses? What does this mean for minority business, sole proprietors? Um, because what we saw is while it was great legislation on the front end, it was the back and that we had to go back and, and retool. And then that kept money from getting to the most vulnerable businesses quickly. Um, so at the level of the folks who are on the implementation end, there has to be that equity lens there as well. Yeah, and in fact, and I'll add, I agree with you. Uh, part of the legislation that we introduced said that we needed to be frankly, more diverse and more inclusive in the management of organizations such as SBA uh, for exactly that reason, so that people could have the lens that it was appropriate when we're, when we're figuring out how to execute on these programs that are nice and beautiful ideas, but imperfect. Uh, and I, I hope that we've tried to get it better at the, at the congressional level, and you're right, it's always the devil in the details, but that's why we need you guys to help us recognize where, where we can be more surgical and where we can be more precise and, and better informed. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, Anna, it looks like you had something to say. I'm going to move my screen because I, I can't see everybody. Just yeah, I, saw, everybody... I think I saw Natalie's hand first. Oh, okay, great, great. Yeah, thank you. Where is Natalie? I'm here, um, oh. and that's okay. Mine is... Um, brief, but one thing that I have been asking the SBA for or that I would love to see um, would be some sort of relief for existing uh, businesses that are SBA borrowers that have been permanently shuttered by COVID. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Section 1112 CARES Act payments have been great, um, but, you know, we're now at the point where we have businesses that have permanently closed and are not going to be reopened. That's an act of default and disqualifies them for getting those payments and leaves the bank with a really, um, you know, difficult, in some cases, taking their personal residence, you know, um, and if we don't take it, our, our guarantees invalidate it, you know, if we don't pursue every avenue of liquidation and recovering collateral. Um, so I would love to see something where, um, you know, business owners who have been have an existing SBA loan and have been permanently closed could work their way out of it without totally destroying their lives. That's a fascinating point. And I'm mm -hmm. sure that uh, Curtis or Mashri and Scott are helping me remember that so that we can put that in our in our collective hive brain and make sure we can try and do something about it. Thank you. Anybody else who wants to comment on that? Anna? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the SBA, I, I heard someone, I think from the SBA the other day say they were the best kept secret and no longer. Um, so that I think that's, I think that's a positive thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it could, it could have just been the PPP, but I think that, um, you know, for the Small Business Administration to have painted with such a broad brush um, in the, you know, kind of the first round of COVID relief, um, you know, there's a huge difference between a sole proprietorship or a business with fewer than you know ten employees, and one with like four hundred and ninety nine, which mm -hmm. technically falls under the window of small business. Um, so, so I think that there needs to be um, a little bit more nuance, a lot more nuance actually in you know in the funding structures um, to to accommodate you know the various sizes of businesses, but also different industries. We've seen. Um, you know, again, like you could be a firm of 10, but you could be a tech firm and just make buckets and buckets of money, or you could be, you know, a landscape contractor and have a hundred people, but not have your revenue be nearly the same. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the employee count is also a little bit challenging. Um, and so really trying to have a little bit more nuance in not just the, you know, the business size, but the industry and a bunch of other, um, you know, factors that I think are going to determine a business's needs. Yeah, that's been kind of part of the problem, just not just with um, small business response in COVID, but also, frankly, with unemployment for individuals as well, is that we just don't have the, uh, the data that we need to be able to be surgically precise with who we're aiming this stuff at, and we need better data. 
you know, so that we understand to your point, you know, what the difference between a sole proprietorship is and, and one that's much larger, or frankly, somebody in the ag space or in the nonprofit space, or, you know, all of these different nuances took quite a long time for us to try to, you know, uh, help. And we were, I, of course, caught quite flat footed as a, as a nation and as a world with the, with the pandemic. But I think your point is right with the SBA being an unkept secret, I guess. So, um, in a lot of ways, that's, I think, why I was kind of asking the question that I was asking about what have we learned from this lesson in terms of, um, for Natalie, you know, we found people that didn't have banking relationships. Now we have them. Now we know where they are and now they're here. You know, how do businesses, how do we take care to, to benefit from the fact that we've we now have direct lines of communication, either small business association or the banks or you know the chambers or whatever to really help and take advantage of the fact that we now have identified a whole subset of people who until then th this time had not been um, supported in the way that they needed to. I'm not by no way saying that we've hit everybody and found everybody, but how do we make sure that we take what has been a horrible situation and make it a better situation um, in 2022 and beyond? And I guess that's my, my final question for you guys is what, what, what do our businesses need, uh, need, particularly our black and minority owned businesses need in 2022? I, I would jump right off of the, the, I think one of the last points that was being made there, which is okay. And I think Regina's assessment of PPP rollout was, was spot on if, Hey, there were some blind spots in, in equity and, and at getting this out the door. Okay, maybe that's understandable at kickoff, but all of, I don't, and I don't wanna pick on SBA because I think you could say this about any organization that's in the public sphere. We all need to be sort of obsessive about, as you said, getting the data and then the continuous improvement of what the good that we're trying to do. So, okay, now look at the numbers. Did we reach the number of minorities that, that we should have? No, well, well, why not? And that needs to happen on a real, you know, was it something, you know, not right about the, the marketing or the communities that we were reaching or the way that we were, um, writing about it on our website or some other blind spot. So, um, and, and, and I, you know, I think, yeah, I think the SBA did th that to a degree I, is my understanding is they dedicated, um, certain windows for just, you know, super small businesses under, under 20 people for a time. I think they dedicated more staff and changed some of the formula, um, to, 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 cause you know, many of these things are unintentional or blind spots, and, but if you're not looking at the data and then adjusting, then, then that's, that's a shortcoming. So, you know, in our, in our staff, um, when we're, you know, I'll go back to coaching entrepreneurs because that's my day to day. Um, anytime we talk about wanting to have our radar up that if we meet a client or meet a, 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 someone we can help and they're, they're from a background that's not traditionally well represented in entrepreneurship, whether it be didn't go to college or whether it be a racial minority or, you know, we, there, it was incumbent upon us to be extra, okay, what are the things that might stop this person from coming back to the well for more help? Do they need an extra, okay, everyone got an email invitation, but would it, how about I pick up the phone and call them, make sure they know they're, no, really, this is for you, right? Mm -hmm. We want you there. So it's little things like that um, in culture that, so there's the data part, but then there's also the culture and and the habits of customer service. Chrissy, I like your point about, you know, whether it's politics or manufacturing, focus on people, take care of people as individuals, right? Um, so I, I think that's gonna be a part of it. And I'll just finish my last thought, because I like, um, I like Anna's point about not being a kept secret. I, I, my, one thing I hope that stays and is needed for our communities is I hope our organizations, whether it's legislatures or groups like mine, COVID has given us a bias, I hope, towards urgency and action, right? In terms of the public expecting us to be there and expecting us to do something about what is not right. So I hope that that is there's certainly better lines of communication now. People, maybe borrowers who know our name or know how to use our website. Those are tactical things, but I hope there's sort of this public psyche of expecting groups to get things done, right? It hasn't always take, been as quick as we want, but I hope that survives the immediate, immediate urgency of the pandemic and expecting groups like ours to be talking on calls like this, to know each other to, and to get results. Because I think um, the public deserves that expectation and it, and it keeps, um, keeps progress possible. Yeah. And I do apologize to you guys because I have a 2.30 that I need to go to, but I, I think it's a good way of concluding, which is to say that I'm really fortunate in Congress that I serve in the Small Business Committee. And a dirty little secret of the Congress is that that tends to be a sleepy little committee where, you know, a freshman hangout until they go to bigger and better things. 
And that's not what it ought to be, right? As we've seen with the pandemic, this is a place where uh, where the power of the economy is, you know, the power of, of our for-profit sector, even many of our nonprofits uh, and, and combinations there in between. Uh, and that's one of the bigger reasons why I asked us to, to, to stay. This is a, a, a purpose of mine as, you know, as a former entrepreneur myself. And that's why I'm really passionate about this. Um, I also coincidentally happened to be passionate about pandemic uh, as an engineer and a, and a former chemistry pro a teacher, which is why I wanted to be on foreign affairs uh, and why I wanted to be on the Asia and Africa subcommittee because I was worried about pandemic. And unfortunately, that concern happened. And because of that concern happening, the small business committee became something that people could talk about. Uh, and the power of the small business committee's response in the Congress and in the Senate was helpful, but was not certainly the answer to everything. And that's why you guys were the answer. You know, you guys pushed up ideas like accelerating uh, and, and simplifying the payment process for uh, or conversion of the of the PPP from loans into grants. You know, you guys told us that you needed that because you needed to simplify that process for our smallest businesses. And you told us that we weren't hitting, you know, our most our smallest of small businesses and the sole proprietorships and the you know nonprofits and all that. You guys told us that we had messed up. Uh, and that's why I do hope as well that this will become a continuing conversation uh, and that you see us and my team as resources. Uh, and I'm grateful for being with you guys. I hope that we'll be able to get your permission to broadcast this bro broadly so that we can share um, what we've learned together. And with that, I'm afraid that I might have to pop off to my next thing, which coincidentally also has to do with small businesses. Um, but please know that we're here as a resource and, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you.